Hello there. Welcome back to the Agostino Zynga Show with me, your host, Agostino Zynga. This is episode number 191. Uno, nueve, uno. How you doing? How you doing? You right there? As you can see, if you're watching this via YouTube, my lips are nice and shiny. If you're wondering why, no, I've not been sucking on all the whatevers. And no, I've not been dousing my mouth in olive oil. Instead, I applied some nice handy Vaseline to my lips to ensure there was no crackling as I'm talking to you via the powers of YouTube. That's probably the most, uh, how would you say, embarrassing thing that you can do on a YouTube video, right? Wear a shirt that's got stains on it, have lips that are chapped, and generally look like a piece of shit. And I've done that, you know, I've kind of achieved that, some of that. As you can tell from the video, my hair's getting to a stage where I kind of have to get a haircut or I kind of have to get this sorted out at the top. I just need to get my dreads done. Um, it's one of those, it's, it's, it's a thing that's kind of plagued me for a while. I'm currently at that kind of stage in hair where it's too long to kind of wear out like this. I kind of have to decide what I want to do with it. But I'm just lazy. and I don't really want to sit down and have my hair dreaded for two hours or, you know, pay 100 quid. Whatever it may be, right? I'm just a lazy fuck. So I've got to get it done sooner rather than later anyway. I've got to get it done. Maybe the end of the month. I've got to figure out a way, man. got to figure out a way. Um... I'm sure there's people out there in the same sort of position as me. And I understand why people just get like, um, you know, standard number twos and fades. Because it's just, you know, there's, there's no um, no faffing around. You know exactly what you have. Or maybe, you know, the little one I used to have, um, I used to be a little bit, well, it used to be maybe, I don't know, a couple of inches. That's when you could just sort of get away with it, right? You just, you know, kind of rub your hair a little bit, put some um, ointment in there, maybe get some, you know, maybe get a shape up every couple of weeks and you're good. But with this kind of hair, even when I sh even when I shave the sides and I get a fade, it still kind of looks a bit shit on the top. So I kind of get I have to get it sorted out and figure out a way for me to come back into the realm of the living. Because at the moment I look a little bit like a zombie, don't I? I look a little bit like I've been sleeping outdoors, um, especially wearing this flipping, you know, especially wearing this hoodie that I got from Mexico. I look like I look like I'm gonna you know pull out a hacky sack and start doing mad knees and you know kick ups and all that shit. Or I've got like a little bat on them. You know, the, you know those African drums white people like love playing in the park? I look at like one of those kind of guys, isn't it, with this hoodie on? But I, I love it, man. Um, straight from Mexico City. Um, authentic, actually. It's one of the rare pieces of merch I bought from another... I bought from like a Central American, South American, you know, that kind of continent. Um, when you buy merch there, it kind of bums you out. Because when you buy it, and you take it back to a little hostel room and you're like, oh, I can't wait to give this to my mom, to this, to this person. You look underneath it and you check where it's made. And it's always like made in Pakistan, made in India, made in Singapore. This is one of the only pieces I've bought um, that was actually made in Mexico. Like amazing, isn't it? Actually made in Mexico. Like fucking awesome. I wish I would have bought more of them, but you know, I was under strict orders not to, you know, from people that I won't mention. You know who you are. Um, anyway, how, welcome back to the show. Hope you guys are well and well hydrated, well rested and all that malarkey. I'm feeling good, feeling happy, feeling fine. A um, little bit under the weather yesterday, but now feeling a lot better today. Uh, training wise, I'll be training again later on today. Hopefully the training session. Yeah, I am, right? Do I have five miles doing today or five miles tomorrow? Might be tomorrow. I'm running a little five mile again tomorrow. Feeling good. Weight's dropping off. Fasting really well. What can you, you can't complain really, innit? You cannot complain. Look where I am. So let's get into it. Um, yesterday, as you guys are aware, Tottenham won their semi-final second leg against Ajax. Um, they somehow managed to do the unthinkable and scored three goals on the night, winning three, well, well, winning three two on the night, and four and you know, three, three, yeah, winning three two on the night and three two on the aggregate. How did they do that? Oh yeah, because they didn't score any goals the first leg. Yeah, so they they're through to the final, and yeah, what a brilliant performance. Um, I think. What everyone can kind of, you know, I think after Liverpool's heroics the other day against Barcelona, it kind of, you know, you you was, you was kind of half expecting it would happen against Ajax too. But the thing that I was more, the Tottenham result was probably a little bit more surprising because I guess Tottenham were thoroughly outclassed in the first leg. Like Ajax looked leaps and bounds ahead of who what Tottenham were able or, or, or what Tottenham were capable of. And then when you added, added to it the, their, um, um, their injuries... Uh, Deli Ali has had a bit of an up and down season. Harry Kane has had a persistent ankle injury that's that's ruled him out for the last couple of games of the season. You didn't really think they had a chance against um against Ajax, and Ajax were kind of purring after that first leg. But I think what you've seen with um most Champions League games is like, especially with the tenacity of English teams, or just in general, I think with sometimes the naivety of some European teams who think you know the the game is already won. 
especially towards the latter stage. I don't think you can take that kind of gamble. I think you can do that when you're like, you know, in the quarterfinal semis for the most part, you probably are going to be the stronger side. But I think what this Champions League run has shown is that when you have your chances to finish the game, you have to finish the game. You can't uh, take your chances lightly. And I guess one chance that comes across, or two chances that come across right to mind with the Barcelona and Liverpool game was a Moussa Dembele chance towards the end, right? Um, he had two chances when he came on. I think he came on the 80th minute. He missed both. And then I think Ajax also had a couple of chances in the first leg to kind of really kill the game and put the game out of reach. And they didn't. They just left with a 1-0 victory, right? Yeah, 1-0 victory. So um, you kind of always had the thinking or the idea that, fuck, this could end really badly for both sides. And, you know, um, I think for most, especially for Tottenham's case, I think it was probably the best thing for them that Ajax scored first. It kind of woke them up. I think Man United have tend to... Man, the old Man United, the vintage one, not, not the one nowadays, but old Man United, that's what used to happen to us. Sometimes go, going away from home in hostile um, European stadiums, if the other team, if the, if the home team scores first, it sometimes gets you, it kicks you into, into gear. Um, sometimes when you score too early, you you end up inviting on loads of pressure, the home crowd gets up and, you know, it can be a long night. But when they score first, you have something to respond to and you kind of know what you, what the game is because I think Tottenham were going to have to score regardless of how many Ajax scored. So they had to just make sure they got something on the, on the, on the score sheet and they did. Um, through Lucas Mora hat trick, a Lucas Mora hat trick, a player who was sold um, from who was sold uh, who was sold from um, PSG to essentially um, free up room on the salary for Neymar to come in, and now you've seen what you know the whole Neymar generation of PSG players have fucking um, destroyed that club for the for the most part. Not you know it's not Neymar specifically; he's not the one only responsible, but. You know, they've, they've hired in loads of hired guns who don't necessarily want to play together in the team and you get the results that they have now. And Lucas Moura, who's kind of had a bit of an up and down season for the most part, been playing understudy to um, Kane and Son when they've been on form, has kind of been, you know, thrust into a limelight, been told to go up front. And one thing you notice about Pochettino's team and something that you've kind of noticed about my United's team is that they just run. They just run. They run for days. They run for absolute days. That effort... That determination, you can't really put it into it. Can't really put it into words, man. What that means to a club, what that means to fans, what that means to players around you. I think, especially nowadays, when you know there is probably a little bit too much emphasis placed on talented players, players that are God have a God given ability to play the game of football. You know, the Cristiano Ronaldo's, the Hazards, the Messi's, the Neymar's, the Paul Pogba's to some extent. Those players are amazing. They are great. They're and. I think, in my opinion, they're a great addition to a great side. But I think the nucleus, the core of a side has to be just those people that just turn up and deliver eight. I mean, seven seven out of ten plus performances every single season, every single game. And I think you could even apply that for your work life, right? I would much rather if I was running a bar or a restaurant or I was a manager of an office or, you know, of an area manager of some sort. The one thing I would want, I wouldn't want just loads of killers, right? I'd want a core team of just really dogged hard workers. People just figure stuff out. They don't might not know how to use a certain program. They might not be familiar with a certain process. They might not know this, might not know that, but they're just going to put their head down, um, nose to the grindstone, and just bang it out and try and figure it out. As a team, as individuals, um, whatever, they're going to try and get to a solution. I'd much rather that than to rely on, you know, 18 maverick geniuses who all have an off day at the same time and then you're completely fucked, right? Or people who are geniuses who kind of, you know, uh, think that they can do the job of, of leader better than you can. They question your authority. They always kind of have something to say. Um, they never just go with your idea and try it out first. And then if that doesn't work, go with their idea. They're always trying to challenge things at every step. I'd much rather have people just come in and do the work. And I think we're seeing this in football. We're seeing this in work environments now. People are probably straying, uh, straying away from the idea of like, you know, um, hiring somebody based solely on the experience that they have or the projects they've done in the past and maybe saying, you know what, is this person the right character fit? Do they get it? Are they aware of what's needed? Um, are they going to be able to rise to a challenge? Will they roll their sleeves up and get in dirty with everybody? And once you find that person, just don't let them go, man, because they are a dime a dozen. And what ends up happening is that once you have the people in your in, in your workforce, I've always said it for the most part, that, you know, I really get annoyed with the startup world interview process. It's really annoying, right? It's a bit convoluted. Um, it's a little bit, um, you know, it's a little bit self-congratulatory in a way. They take themselves a bit too seriously. 
you know, there's always those kind of questions about, oh, what this, what does this app or this service mean to you? How do you think you can make a difference? Like, loads of really like wanky comments that, you know, for the most part, the person that's applying doesn't really care about, right? They're essentially, uh, they're, you know, 80% of the reason why you apply for a job is because you want to get paid and pay the rent and be able to go on holiday and be able to buy trainers and shit. I don't know, whatever you do with your money. So for them to suggest or for them to kind of, you know, put it, um, put questions to you as if you're an entrepreneur, as if you want to be an entrepreneur at that company is a little bit disingenuous. But I also understand the idea behind making sure you get people who at, at least for the at least at least think the way that you think as a company have the same kind of mindset. That's all you want. You don't want them to exactly, you know, go with everything you're saying and agree with all any action and maybe be a little bit over over self over um enthusiastic about your product or service, but you want them to at least get what you're about so that what happens is that when they come in, they're going to create a culture that's going to be, you know, a co- not a company culture that you have to make up in a deck or you have to, you know, present on a fucking PowerPoint screen. Just a culture that they're just going to get from what people are just going to get the culture when they walk into the room. They're going to be like, oh, this is what it's about. OK, I get it. 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 Um, yeah, so that's what I think in general. That's what I think. Workplaces are weird. But anyway. Let's get into some topics, get into some topics, that's what we need to do. Alright, so um, I spoke about a lot yesterday, right? Arrivals, theme, smashers, what else did I speak about? No more cash, uh, Aisha Car. oh, let, do you want to see um, Met Gala party pictures actually? These look quite cool. Um, the party pictures were taken by someone called Medi Lacoste, who I'm not too familiar with. Uh, he sounds like he might be from here actually. Or my, or my being dumb. Did you sound like he's from here? I think he might be from here, to be honest. I'm not sure if he is, but if he is, congratulations. And if he isn't, whoever took them, sorry. <clears throat> um, but yeah, there's these, uh, let me see if I can find them. Where are they? There's pictures here from the after party that look fucking awesome. So I think they'll film, um, or film camp, well, you know, film images, 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 film images, images of film, 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 film. Uh, pictures taken on a 35mm camera, which is kind of all the rage now. I think a couple of guests I saw in a Met Gala, I'm not sure who it was, but a couple of people were given, looks like they were given disposable cameras to take pictures on, so I think that might be part of the whole promo rollout for this. I'm pretty sure, I wonder how, how they get it all processed. Do they have like their own little processing booth that they get, they just give their roles to and they process them really quickly because they get the pictures up really fast, man. Literally happened the other day and the next day they had the images already up and ready to go. Um, it might not be even a film camera, it might be something else, digital, I don't know. But so far, I'm going to say they're film. And if they aren't, I'm wrong. And if I'm wrong, I'm wrong. Uh, let me get this up here. Make this full screen. Transform, fit to screen here, boom. All right, let's look at them. So number one, you've got Lady Gaga, right? you got Lady Gaga in, I think this is outfit number four of the of her Met Gala looks as she was coming up the stairs, right? I think she changed twice before she even walked up the stairs, right? Absolute boss, love her. Um, Serena Williams, uh, I saw a really cruel meme about her actually. She said her outfit looked like scrambled eggs with bacon. Oh, <laughs> people on the internet are the worst. This guy here looks like Post Malone, his arm broken. That's commitment though, isn't it? One of the photographers came to the fucking Met Gala with his arm broken, man. No, 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 sh- no shit. No, um, didn't give a fucking fuck. Um, I forgot that. That's Billy Porter, right? I'm sure. Billy Porter, that amazing gold outfit came in with, I don't know, six dozen men or so carrying him. And he's lying. Uh, Katy Perry dresses a chandelier. Pass on that one. She's so extra and annoying. Um, I don't know. Loads of people here. That's Maluma, right? I didn't know who that was. So this, this is the guy that supposed to be a lot of my um, Spanish colleagues and Spanish people that I know are super hot for this dude. Um, gay guys love him. Girls love him. He's just like a. He's just an overall snack for those people. And again, I saw his. I saw his outfit. He's suit, and I was like, shit, who the fuck is that dude? Right? He looked. I thought this guy's really handsome. Number one, and the outfit looked amazing. And then obviously, I found out that was Maluma. I remember saying to. <laughs> I remember saying to the missus when she showed me Maluma the first time, she's like, "Oh, this Maluma guy's really hot. All my friends love him." I was like, "He's not. He's, he's not all that." You know that kind of automatic hating, that automatic boy hating comment. He's not all that. Who the fuck's that? I don't get the hype about Jude Law, man. Why do guys like? Why do girls like him? You know that kind of automatic boy hate thing. You can't help it; it just comes out of you, isn't it? So then I said that. And then I remember seeing that picture and then showing her. And she was like, oh, do you know who that is? I was like, no, the, 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 that's fucking Maluma, you idiot. I was like, oh, 
Sorry about that. Um, take that back then. Yeah, Maluma, man, you're doing all right, man. You don't need my, you don't need my, you don't need my stamp of approval. But in case you did, <laughs> this guy from Stratford thinks you look all right for a dude. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah he looked amazing i love his outfit i loved how he how he styled himself uh the hair the beard yeah he looked great he looked awesome um let's continue here who else do we have here we have of course the kardashian sisters looking wonderful they all look great don't they really um probably you know i'd uh, I, i'm still gonna say kim is the standout i think that look that wet t-shirt look is just insane the way they got made it got that done their hair the styling you watch the video with like four people around her like i don't know four or six people like basically fitting this thing around fitting this thing on her body right it, it talk about couture this was couture couture capital c couture Literally, yeah really really great they look they always look really good though and i don't think they've all in, ever had outfits the collection sisters where they go to like a you know a celebrity function where they look horrible for the most part um they just really they get the styling done really well and I think maybe there's some codes in there about colors, about the amount of panels and patterns. It doesn't, they don't, they, they don't ever look fussy. They don't ever look like they've, they've got too much on. They don't ever look like they've got, they're, sometimes someone could argue they don't, they don't look like they have enough on, but they look like, you know, just look, just great. They're just styling to the, you know, to perfection. Now, of course, you know, that might be because it's their job and, you know, that's what they do for a profession. They have to get it right. But I think there is a real talent in looking good all the time consistently. It's really, really hard to do. Trust me, I've tried. Um, <laughs> failed many, many times. And they really do a really good job of it. Especially because, you know, there's so much on the line for these girls at these kind of shows. Because, you know, for, for all the good Kim has done over the years and for the amount of influence she's garnered over the years and the respect she's gained and association with Kanye, the marriage, and then the fact that he kind of brought her in and really championed her being a really good husband in that case, you still get the feeling the fashion world just can't wait for an opportunity to kind of kick her out, looking for any excuse. So I think there's a lot on the line for her to get these outfits right because he knows if she gets it right, wrong, if she fumbles the ball, if she doesn't really come with it at the show, they're going to destroy her. They're going to destroy her. So she has to kind of get it right. Um, so yeah, um, big kudos to these girls, man. They all look stunning. All look great. Love the outfits. Um... Kate Moss, you know, standard. She, she, she didn't really show out as much as um, maybe in previous years or in other times that you've seen her on the red carpet. But, you know, she has a whole fucking archive full of stunning looks, you know. She's allowed to have a, a kind of a chill day once. Uh, that's um, Ambush guy, right? Um, verbal, right? From Ambush Jewelry. So I guess Yoon was there. But no one took her picture, which is a bit of a shame. I wish maybe she was somewhere else. Doing somewhere else fun. Loads, loads of nice pictures here. Film camera pictures of like old guys taking pictures of things. Funny. Hamish Bowles here looking fucking incredible. I wonder what that is he's wearing. Is this Com? Do you think this is Com? Is this Com de Garçon? Might be Com de Garçon, you know. Or am I not? I think this is Com de Garçon home. I'm pretty sure. If it's not Com de Garçon, is it Sakai? Is it maybe Custom Haida Aikerman? Oh, uh, who's the millinery? That's a millinery guy behind him. I forgot his name. Oh, the one that makes hats. Fucking, what's his name? Stephen Jones? Stephen Jones? I think so. Um, but yeah, I think that's Hamish Bowles. Hamish Bowles, I'm, I'm pretty sure that's Com. That hair reminds me of, there was a Com uh, collection where they kind of had their hair all swelly and kind of gelled onto the side. That's not exactly gelled, gelled, but it looks similar. But I don't know. That looked really nice. So I fucking love that robe. Uh, bathrobe kind of look. I'm, I'm all for the volume. I'm all for the fucking length and shit. So that wins in my book. Big fan of that one. Well done, Hamish. Um, yeah, there's Stephen Jones there. I'm not sure who the lady is covering her mouth, but she looks great. Uh, not sure who that guy is in front either. I actually need to read that fucking um, essay that this is the theme is based on. I think it's called um, Camp in It, Notes on Fashion. Right? I need to actually read it. Oh, this looks awesome. Look from the back how great that looks. So awesome how they pinch it. Look, it's just... <sighs> The little droplets on the side. Jesus Christ. Just so good. His other part pictures are quite nice, actually. Ezra Miller here with that makeup with the eyes all over his face. Looks really cool, too. Michael B. Jordan. Uh, I said to somebody the other day that Michael B. Jordan is like, um, has that similar build to The Rock. And maybe he's unfortunate in the sense of the brands that he lands himself with. Because, you know, for all the love that I have for Virgil, no one would say he's like an expert tailor, right? You wouldn't necessarily say he's one, really, would you? Right? So I think when he goes to these kind of runway shows and he's wearing, uh, he's trying to wear tailored suits. Because of his build, he probably needs a designer is able to kind of make a suit 
that fits well, that kind of complements his body. That's maybe, you know, I don't know, the proportions on the arm are different because of his biceps and forearm. I don't know. However you cut a suit, you might need it just to be essentially crafted on him uh 3d printed around his body actually a balenciaga suit would look pretty pretty good on him isn't it i think that balenciaga suit with the massive shoulders like really um really um again a custom one maybe really kind of coming on on this on the on the hips accentuate kind of his figure and stuff i think that might look really cool or maybe um what's his face would make a good suit for him uh john galliano might be a bit too camp for him maybe a bit too a bit too extravagant for michael jordan's taste but i think he would look quite good in that sort of stuff but again i just think it's a bit difficult for him to look good in suits that are kind of off the rack kind of looking wise that's a, that's a problem that he probably has but again i think it's just the issue of being wham when you're when you're when you're fucking muscular as fuck it's just some things you're just not going to look good and you just have to kind of chalk it up to the game and it is what it is um it's either that or you you know you try and do loads of coke and get super skinny which probably isn't going to happen end up probably losing your family and your home and shit um again katie perry with the extraness not a fan get out of here jeremy scott looked amazing though i loved him he styled quite a lot of people in this runway show isn't it for met garland loads of people were wearing moschino jamie fox uh peeking into cardi b's outfit i was a good big fan of tom brown not sure who this lady is but the rose not sure who these ladies are oh that's um i'm not sure that's a plus size model i forgot her name the back of Hailey Bieber and Kim Kardashian. Hailey Bieber with that long back, right? That that long back. They will do that really good arch. Makes them look like they have a bum that pops up. But in real life, that's what it looks like. Ha ha ha. You know, people point at some stuff like that and say, oh, see, they're normal like us. No, they're not. She's still stunning, right? Don't take the piss out of her because she has a flat bum. Doesn't matter. She's still hot as fuck. Um... Yeah, loads of great pictures. I think Medi Across smashed it here. These are really nice pictures, really warm. I think he's he has a relationship with some of these people he's taking a picture with. You can see they like him to be there. He's taking pictures. People are smiling, having a good time. Jones is smiling. Got Harry Styles giving him a rose and shit. Really nice pictures from Medi Medi Across here. Solange looking great in her sunnexing outfit. Oof, looking stunning there. So I recommend you check it out. It's really nice. Um, I'll link it into the show notes. Loads of pictures here from the Met Gala. Let's skip ahead because, you know, this is getting a bit boring. If you weren't there, you weren't there, innit? Like I said yesterday, imagine standing outside waiting for people to come out for this Met Gala and wishing them a good party. Hope you have a good party. Hope you enjoy your time. He's like, thank you, I will. Fucking ugh. It feels so awful when it's that. Being a fan of celebrities must be like, must be up there with like being a hype beast and being proud of it, right? I always say, I always thought being a hype beast and being proud of it is like the ultimate, you know, you know, you, you, you always feel a little bit, you always kind of feel a little bit cringe. You always kind of, you know, you know how uncool you are, but you just don't care. You just can't help buying the most expensive, most limited item and, you know, wearing it all at once and looking like an absolute dullard, right? You can't help it. It must be the same with these celebrity things, right? You just can't help getting involved and caring about what they do and who's marrying what and is she pregnant? Is she not? Are they together? Are they not? It must be horrible, and it having so that so much of that information in your head. I kind of, I kind of, um, I kind of find it similar to people that are like you know fanatical, like people that are fanatical about politics, right? People that are watching news every single day, every minute of the day, right? They think the world's gonna burn down. They always, you know, they're hoping Trump gets impeached. They're arguing about Brexit every day. Those kind of people in my life must be exhausting, right? You just got nothing else that occupies your mind apart from these things that are outside of your control. Whether it's celebrities, whether it's politics, you can't influence them one bit whatsoever unless you decide to be a politician, unless you become to decide to be a celebrity. Or, but that's you know, again, not likely. But yeah, it must be frustrating to have that much use of information in your head. But what do I know? I have a lot of useful information in my head too, and I have used to stuff in my fucking hair. My hair looks so dirty right now, doesn't it? Ugh. whatever continue continue what's next on the list here uh off black oh you should talk about that again Ugh, yeah let's go a little bit so um i mentioned the other day that there's a group of people out there that are hell bent on making sure that they cancel virgil for reasons i have no idea about i'm not sure what he's done wrong um for the most part to these people that they feel as if like this is the appropriate response but again i just think we live in an era and time when people are just a bit confused they don't know they don't know what the best thing is to do they're looking for a way in and sometimes they feel as if people that have a platform owe them uh have a responsibility to them to do things the way that they want them to be done 
I don't agree with it. I think it's backwards thinking. I think it's uh, famine thinking. I think it's thinking for people that aren't doers. When you're not a practitioner, when you're just a commentator from the sidelines, yapping, yapping away, you're going to feel as if like the people doing the stuff owe you some kind of... Um, um, what do they? What's that thing that they're doing now in, in America where they're trying to make... trying to, um, They're trying to go... They're, they're trying to account for all the years of slavery and give people money. Reparations, right? Reparations? Yeah, in some way, shape, shape or form, something like that. Like they, they feel as if there's like a charity that you, you have to kind of automatically sign up to. That's probably why some celebrities aren't really forthright about the charities that they don't support, right? They just support the ones they do or they just keep quiet. Because I guess people sometimes have this weird thinking in their head that because you're somebody of note, you kind of have to give back. What if Baffy don't? What about if you have no feeling towards it? What about if you just don't want to do it? Can you not do that? Is that possible? Yeah, because it's your thing you built yourself. I think, you know... None of these things happen by chance. You don't suddenly become the number one designer in a culture where designers are too, you know, to a penny. The designers are around every, on every fucking street corner in every city of the world making something, right, that no one's probably buying. Yet, you know, the industry or the brands or us as a scene decide to adorn Virgil as the kind of spokesperson for the scene. It's not a coincidence. It's, no, it's not by luck or chance, right? There's loads of work that's been put into that. But some people see that and just think, oh, you owe me this. You have to put this there. You have to do things like that. And it's like, come on, dude. That's not how things work. I'm from the. I'm from the. I'm from a school of thought where you know when I used to go out in Dawson and Shoreditch, and I used to you know we used to go to these parties in Shoreditch and Dawson, and we used to think these parties were fucking god awful and they were playing the worst music. The first thing that we did was just thought, you know what? Let's just start our own party then, right? Let's let's just let's do things our way because we think we can do it better. All right, let's do it that way instead of just complaining about what people are doing and not having any resolutions. I don't, I don't, I don't really um, mess with that whatsoever. I don't think that's admirable. I don't think that's cool. I just think it's kind of a bit ridiculous, right? That you think you think you have the you think you have the necessary um, answers to answer all the questions in the world, but you haven't necessarily done anything to answer those questions. You're just looking at what someone else is doing and hoping that they answer the questions for you in the way that you want it to be done. Like, come on, man. So that being said. There's this really weird article on um, a website called blackenterprise.com about this guy called um, Cardi B's album artist launches a brand calling out Virgil's silence on diversity, right? Um, which is, again, I'll read a bit, bit about it and then we'll move on quickly because I'm sure he's going to be saying loads of infuriating things. But let's see what he has to say. Nikki Chulo is a graphic designer who has helped create album covers for household names, including Cardi B. However, he views his art... Like again, not, not to be mean, but um, it's interesting how they said for household names and they only mentioned Cardi B, right? They didn't mention anyone else. Names. Where's the rest of them? Mm, I think this might be a lie. But anyway, I'm not going to say nothing. But let's continue. Hold on. Zoom out. Yeah. As creative director of Louis Vuitton, Virgil has a high ranked position as fashion. Again, loads of really triggering words. Where is this entitlement that he owes you anything? Like, mama mia some of these people man it's just insane the level of and i just i, I think again I, I just don't i'm not too sure if this is really even gen, genuine i'm sure this is just like um fake wokeism right fake woke it's not even like um a real thing that they're actually annoyed by it's just that they're or, or maybe they're annoyed about the symbolism of it more so about less about virgil it's more so about him as a symbol like he's the only one like in their eyes he's the only one that's got given a chance and look what he's doing right as opposed to like oh he's only hiring white people i'm sure that's the issue they have with it if that is the issue they have with it and imagine that was true imagine he didn't collaborate with all these you know amazing black creators imagine he's fucking front um front row in his show wasn't populated by all amazing people from all over the world imagine that wasn't true the, again, my answer would be if you think he's not representing us as a collective, right? Again, I don't. I'm not a fan of that. I think you should treat yourself as an individual first. Do well as an individual first, and then that will further the collective, as opposed to just banding behind this collective flag that no one really agrees with. I, even if that was true, do it yourself. Show him how he should be done. Um. Last month, Virgil started a behind-the-scenes look. Shared a behind-the-scenes look at a party for his brand of white. The footage sparked a firestorm of backlash on social media. This social media backlash as well. You ignore it for a week and it goes away. You shouldn't even answer it on social. It's just like, you know. Uh, Off-white team too white and noted that they appear to be no black artists or brand owned by a black man. Chulo created his own apparel line called Off Black in what he says is a call to task it's called to have as a task when he's in the process to empower black creators. Uh, 
<laughs> off black. Come on, man. You couldn't think of anything more original, brother. You couldn't come harder than off black. Really, for real, my G. Off black, yeah. Call to arms, right? You're gonna what? You're gonna you you're gonna fly to Milan outside of New Guards Group offices. That's probably six stories up in front of a big, massive brown doll, a security guard that ain't gonna let you in for shit. And what? Pick it out there and say he needs to hire more black people. They're going to be looking at you like, what the fuck are you doing? Go home, man. Do you want a coffee? Do you know what I mean? Like, what is this? In an interview, Trillo's like, oh. Nah, I'm not going to even. Anyway, uh, describe your background as a designer. I'm currently a director at Atlantic Records with a background in graphic design. I've been graphic designer for almost 10 years now, and it's been a very wild ride. Okay, what are some of the most impactful projects? I don't care about that. Let's see what he's going to sell off black. What inspired, me, what inspired me is a lack of diversity of Virgil's off-white team. Even if he's just the face of the brand, I believe he was... A, what? Is this a rumor in, uh, in the fashion field that he's just the face for off-white? He doesn't actually, it's not actually his brand. Is that a thing? Is that a well-known thing that I'm not aware of? I'm not sure that's true, right? Even just the face of a brand, I believe he has responsibility to speak up on behalf of diversity. No, he doesn't. No, he does not. I'm not discredited to a lot of white, but knowing how hard I work, especially as a designer of, of color, to get to where a designer of color. So there's DOC now. There's POC, person of color. Now you describe yourself as a DOC. Mamma mia. Imagine, imagine knowing full well you only got hired to a design position because you're black. Imagine how that must feel, your self-confidence wise, right? Already, right? In a creative field, you're already... It's quite a, it's quite um up and down industry for the most part because you know you're having to um surrender yourself to people's approval, working with clients, working with brands, right? Um, everything gets second guessed, so you're always kind of you know having to um put your ego to one side. Then imagine finally getting a job with an amazing agency. You're signing a contract with some a client that's gonna you know essentially pay for your life for the next five years, and finding out the they'll only hired you because they wanted you to be part of their um diversity quota. How shit would you feel? For real. How shit would you feel? This adversity thing people are talking about is just garbage. It's nonsense. Actions speak louder than words, man. I don't want to hear somebody hiring 30... That's, that's the thing I have a problem with the whole women DJ thing, right? It's like, there's loads of great women DJs out there. The industry was just behind the times in terms of who they're hiring. They're hiring the same old, old, grey, um, wrinkly faces in every fucking lineup, especially Fabric, that 25th anniversary lineup, boring, same people again and again and again and again and again, right? Not even, it wasn't even a male and female thing, just the same people, the same probably 10, 15 DJs that they know that they can sell tickets off the back of, not trying to cultivate a scene like other cities in the world do, right? Not doing that whatsoever, just promoting the same people. So then when the whole women conversation came around electronic music, it annoyed me because it's not about quotes, it's about making club promoters, making booking agents, making uh, club owners, all these people responsible and tell them, look, highlight some new voices, get some new people on the, on the thing so to freshen up the dance floor, bring better people in. That's what I remember back in the day, right? You saw anyone, it was it was a free-for-all behind the deck. So it wasn't about getting two or three girls. It was just like, who's the, who's the best? Who plays this kind of sound? What do I want to hear? Just get them involved. It's not about calls. Just get them involved. Just get more girls involved. You don't have to say, like, Field Day or that. Is it Field Day? We're going to get 50% women. 50, the line's going to 50% only women. It's like, come on, man. That's not the way to just want to... I'm sure there's loads of dudes out there who don't get booked for any festivals and are bemoaning the fact that, you know, suddenly now there's a quota. Why can't there be a quota for everyone? <sighs> I'm, I'm hurt. What's that? Um... I'm not discrediting the talent of Off-White, but knowing how hard I worked, especially as a designer for of colour, to get where I am, it hurt a bit. Blood, sweat and tears. What, what hurt? He's like, his Christmas party hurt your feelings. What? What? Okay. Blood, sweat and tears, relationship, lack of sleep, uh, having to be twice, if not three times, as good as to be seen. Standard, man. That's standard. But what? What? So the thing that we said... The thing that I, the thing is that black people used to say to themselves to give themselves a bit of encouragement to get them over the line, right? Saying that, you know, you have to be twice as good as whoever is in that role to get the role. The thing that we used to give ourselves a bit of a pep if we didn't get the job in general or whatever it may be, we're now using it against each other as what? As a form of saying, I had, I had to work harder than you. Or you know how hard we work. You can't now be fucking it up. You can't fumble the ball. In my opinion, you can't. Is that what we're doing now? Wow. 
having been having to be ready for anything at all times we need more people of color in the room we need more people of color inside the room what type of dialogue are you looking for to create off black merchandise i remember virgil once tweeted design is the freshest scam and i thought that was very very cornable tweet design is purposeful always <sighs> yeah he does say some corny stuff but you know again this is again i think this stems this is a, probably a, a good highlight this stems from just people just not liking him i think that tweet there really that i think that question there really kind of highlights he just doesn't like the dude doesn't rate him i think a lot of people out there i think a lot of creatives a lot of black creative for the most part they don't necessarily like the stuff that virgil does i guess maybe because he doesn't necessarily frequent the black spaces as some of these work people like to come communicate like right he's not necessarily in those spaces i think some of them people kind of think he's kind of come from other and maybe he's associated with kanye and kanye not being kind of the friend of the black people at the moment with his trump association maybe he's just for suffering from it because i just don't understand where this is coming from you're going to create a whole brand of a whole line of merchandise solely because of one video you saw of virgil abloh's off white party in milan like yeesh why were you initially hesitant to release the apparel i was definitely hesitant at first i knew it was going to do this if i had to be in, in all in in the end i found out that virgil was blocking people who reached out to him who reached out to him in an instagram message with diversity hashtag which i think is dismissive and irresponsible no it isn't if, if i don't want to see your stupid tweets or your stupid messages i'm going to block you too like leave me alone i'm doing my work if it's not to your standards get your own brand not that don't piggyback off my brand and call it off black you fucking son of a bitch like oh you have a platform and we want answers not why are you demanding answers it's so annoying oh my god honestly maybe because it's just me it's just i can't out fathom i can't fathom going to another man and risk requiring answers in order for me to further my life there are so many books out there many that i have behind me we have all the answers in there interviews um documentaries with people that have been in the industry white black small um fat whatever they may, may be some old designers some new designers talking about how they got their footing in the industry read listen watch those interviews find out what they did what they did right what they did wrong and apply it to your own life and do what you think he's not doing try it do it that way actions louder speak speak louder than words not piggybacking off his brand not trying to troll him on these instagram comments with hashtag diversity leave me alone oh isn't he doing a retrospective in his hometown in chicago next year to 2020 let's see what that looks like right let's let's see let's see how many of these work people will be there protesting let's see how long this um fake outrage lasts god damn it right or wrong why not be transparent lastly my girl was like baby you know you want to do this and i was like angel you're 100 oh, this guy is the most corniest dude i've seen in my life man what will you do with the proceeds one more cent of the proceeds will go to the what wines for leaders amongst leaders i think the conversation we've started is equally if not more important than the money we're raising i hope to inspire and in black mate that proceeds going to this charity is awesome congratulations well done right pat on the back for being um socially aware and you know foregoing the profits um into your own bank account and giving people that are more in need no problem great you're doing awesome there but this narrative that somehow Virgil is the enemy of black people and that he's not furthering the black conversation, that he's not somehow furthering the other conversation that isn't even to do with black, just people that don't look like whatever we've seen in runway fashion shows. The fact that you think that you're saying that he's not doing it is ridiculous, ridiculous. You and I both know as fellow creatives, right? I, I went to a design school myself. I partake in dabbling a couple of design bits here and there, but I wouldn't call myself a brand owner or a clothing designer by no means, shape or form. But being from both from the creative field, my friend, we both know that, you know, the calling or that kind of twinge that you get inside of you to create, to make something, it comes from a deep place, right? Most of the time it comes from an intrinsic need just to make something. You feel like, you know, you feel weird not drawing one day. You feel odd not opening up Photoshop and just fucking around, right? It's a calling that you kind of feel as to make stuff, right? In the physical, in the digital, whatever it may be. But sometimes, in my case, you stumble across an amazing TV show that really just strikes a chord of you and suddenly you're like, I know what I want to do for the rest of my life. And that show, um, 
was uh, Seymour Powell, right? There's a documentary on BBC here in the UK called Seymour Powell, and it was about a, a, a design agency, a product design agency or an industrial design agency based here in the UK called Seymour and Powell, and they were making everything from Dyson Hoovers to remote controls uh, to windows to car seats and that really inspired me it essentially was what guided me to the path that i'm in now at the moment that's what it was one program changed my life forever and you know who simon power are? two very 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 white guys right i'll show you an image of them right here they are seymour and power or seymour power That's Seymour Powell, right? These two guys are the ones that inspired me to get into 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 design, right? And then that led to fashion, that led to music, that led to graphic design. These are the people that got me interested. These two people, these two white guys, right? It's just about seeing that it can be done and it gives you a hint. It gives you an, a, a, a realization that, wow, I can do this too. So if you're so to say that Virgil isn't furthering the furthering the conversation, isn't allowing the conversation to be had, isn't inspiring other black creatives or people that aren't white or aren't the necessarily dominant voice in fashion to get into fashion, is disingenuous and a downright lie. You know it. You know it. All it takes is one person. Even if you don't agree with what he's doing or how he's doing things, he's too celebrity endorsed. He's only there because of Kanye. His brand isn't that good. Uh, uh, uh. Whatever your whatever your misgivings are, you, you cannot deny. You cannot deny that just having him come out at the end of the runway, you know, with Ian Connor putting his hands together. Um, I don't know with Naomi Campbell, all this stuff that he's doing at the end of the runway show, being appointed Louis Vuitton uh, men's designer. You cannot deny that some kid somewhere in a random house town, not in any kind of hotspot metropolitan city, is not sitting there thinking, wow, I could do that too. So I could also become a fashion designer. Look, goes on Google, finds out his nearest fashion school, enrolls or maybe doesn't enroll, learns how to sew at home by hand. You can't, you can't ignore that that is going to inspire somebody. So sometimes... I understand it can be frustrating you're creative in your own right you're probably not getting recognition that you want to get you think you're better than you are you sorry um you, you think you're maybe better than the position you currently are at i understand i've kind of had those feelings myself but what you cannot do is then start you know those feelings of inadequacy of thinking as if like you maybe should be further on in your career the what the one thing that you can't do or shouldn't do is then start pointing things at people who are further on in their career who probably are doing things that you maybe hope you should do and point fingers and say they're not doing x y and z you can't do that that's not what you should do you should use all that anger and resentment you have and apply it into doing your work that's my that's what i would do further your work further your work hone your craft um promote the mission that you want to promote and maybe by you doing you might end up inspiring virgil to to start doing what you're doing too or maybe not maybe it's all well and good he does things his way you do things your way and we that way we create a much better world and better opportunities for the people coming after us right that's what we essentially want right we don't want it to be a world where we're the only tokens in the in the room we don't want it to be that we're the only ones that kind of got through because we have sheer tenacity and, and you know, fortitude and will. We want other kids to have maybe an easier route through. That's what we all want, right? For our own kids, for kids coming up. That's what we want, right? <sighs> Some of these people, man, honestly. It's, in it's incredible. It's really incredible. I guess, again, maybe because I'm far removed from kind of that kind of way of thinking, but it's just, it's bizarre, man. The level of entitlement that you would have about somebody else's work and how they should go about doing their thing. Why don't you get up here off your own ass and do it yourself? If it's if it's that easy. Anyway, move on from that one. Frustrating to say the least. Frustrating to say the least. Uh, oh, this is funny. Not well, funny and not funny for the same part of it. Not funny, not funny, 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 not funny, 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 funny. So there's this video that came out recently of Aisha Curry, one Aisha Curry, Steph Curry's wife, uh, talking on the red table with Jada Pinkett Smith, and um, she says something that kind of got everybody up in the in in up in arms, up in arms, up in arms. I don't really think it's, there's much to be up in arms about, but again, you know, it's the internet. People get up in arms about the most minute of things. Let's click it, and I shall show you. There we go. Let's scan it forward a bit here. Bit of an insecurity. Wait, there, there you go. Come so on. Really, Bob Pam. But she ripped Pam. 
but she revealed that she wants men go. to look her way too. Something that really bothers me and like honestly has given me a sense of a little bit of an insecurity is the fact that yeah, like there are all these women like throwing themselves, but me, like the past ten years, like I don't have any of that. Like I have zero this sounds weird, but like male attention. And so then you like I begin to internalize it and I'm like, is something wrong with you're me? Not, like you're not looking. what you're not like looking. Cause I don't want it, but yeah. it'd be nice to know that like it's funny right so she gets she gets killed for this comment online because you know people on social like to kill people for saying things when they're being honest and speaking from the heart uh liam nelson being one of them right he kind of you know maybe he spoke he, maybe the way he said it was fucked up but essentially he said he had racist thoughts he realized it was crazy and he hasn't done it since Still crazy, I guess. You know, go saying you want to go out and hit some random black people with a baseball bat because a black person <laughs> raped your sister is nuts. <laughs> Sorry, Liam Neeson's a fucking psycho. Maybe that's not a good example, but anyway, <laughs> you know what I'm talking about. Oh Jesus Christ, Liam Neeson, man. Honestly, his agents must have been like, "Shut up, man." It was a week of his film opening, and everyone, I think, said in the reviews it's probably his best movie he's done so far, which isn't probably, you know, much to say because, you know, all these movies are the same. The Takens, you know, he essentially plays the same character in every movie. Even in Widow, he's basically the same character, right? Um, but everyone was basically, the reviews were quite positive for that movie he did, right? Where it's, I think it's an Antarctic, is it Antarctic? Or is it, he's like a, he's like a, what is he, a snowman or some shit? I don't know. Um, again, does someone go missing in that too? Yeah, it does, right? Does his kid go missing or his kid dies or some shit? <laughs> Everyone was saying it was one of his best performances, and then the during the press junket, during the press, you know, the standard press tour, they go around talking about, oh, did you do your own stunts? Or how was it working with this person? You know, the standard question. He somehow started to divulge some fucking deep, his deepest, darkest secrets <laughs> during this fucking cancel culture where you can't even tweet. If you miss tweet, you fucking get cancelled, right? This guy thought he could go. <laughs> he, this guy thought he could talk about <laughs> the time when he wanted to kill black people. <laughs> <laughs> honestly <laughs> this guy's a psycho man <laughs> honestly what he could just talk about that with no repercussions he's like it's a little nutcase <laughs> oh, god bless me i just imagine these ages and his managers thinking no 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 no, no. trying to like, get on the phone and damage control and review by that time the fucking quotes have gone out and the interweb that they're out there forever Oh, Liam Neeson's a legend. Anyway, um, fuck, man. I don't know why I made me laugh so much. Shit, I'm oh, crying. Anyway, um, back to Aisha Curry. Aisha Curry. Aisha Curry. So Aisha Curry sits down on the red table. And, you know, she's fairly honest. And I think it's something that I've spoken about in general, you know, in terms of us as humans, right? Human nature, sexual attraction, male and female, whoever you're attracted to. There is a part of us that sometimes, you know, dresses up. Um, for peacocking purposes. And this kind of makes me think about that famous exchange between Jordan Peterson and that really snotty Vice um, uh, Vice News um, interviewer, right? Let me try and get up, actually. Yeah? Why, why women wear makeup? I think that kind of um, speaks upon this. And I think that kind of gives a bit of context. I'll get that clip up now so that we can talk about it together. Because I think there's, there's something that we can learn from this as a society. Look at me twitching beside what they should do. Jordan Peterson, what's his name? I'm talking about him, I'm talking about, talk about Jordan Peterson, makeup. Should Vice, right? Yeah, this is the one. Uh, what is it? Should women wear makeup? Let's see here, Vice. Where is it? Let's get off here. Here's a question. Well, I post, here's a question. Let's have a real question. Can men and women work together in the workplace? Yes, I do. How do you do it? How do you know? Because I work with a lot of women. Right. Well, it's been happening for what, 40 years? And things are deteriorating very rapidly at the moment in terms of the relationships between men and women. We don't know if men and women can work together. But in what ways? Because, like, in the sexual harassment, 40 years ago, I would have been like, I don't know. Let's get ahead of it. If you feel like, let's get ahead of it. Let's get ahead of it. There's a bit about makeup. Why? In any sort of pure logical sense, like you're 
No, no one's saying that. Those two are just behavior at all. You feel like your classroom would have a higher chance. Oh, let me see. Let me see. Where is it? Make a bit. Where is it? That, that a woman who works in entertainment must then like pledge and leave door. You know, we don't know how. Is one thing, and that. Come on, where is it? The makeup bit. Talk about makeup. Where is it? Oh, I need to find it. Oh. What's the purpose of makeup? Oh, there we go. There we go. Why would that be? How about no makeup in the workplace? Why would that be? Why should you wear makeup in the workplace? Isn't that sexually provocative? No, it's not. No. What is it? What's the purpose of makeup? Some people would like to just put on makeup. What? I don't know why. Why do you make your lips red? Because they turn red during sexual arousal. That's why. Why do you put rouge on your cheeks? Same reason. So your argument. I'm not saying that you shouldn't wear makeup. No, no, I'm not saying that. But you're saying that that when women put on makeup in the workplace, that they have sexualized themselves in a way. That's, that's what makeup's make for. That Jesus, that's self-evident. Self Why else would you wear it? That, 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 and there you go, right? So that basically gives some context from what I think about this whole issue. And I think he goes on to talk about high heels and why, you know, the purpose of high heels in the first place, you know, to accentuate the whatever, the arsenal, that sort of malarkey or posture. So there is a there is a side of it. There is a side of it. I, I completely understand and appreciate where Aisha, Aisha Curry is coming from. There is a side of it where I think most women would, would admit if they were able to be honest that they do get sometimes you know they do get overly doled up and dressed up for their friends you know for to feel you know for self-assurance and to feel pretty themselves all that malarkey but also part of it is to look hot right you want to look cute you want to look pretty you want guys to say something or to give you kind of some kind of attention some kind of um i wouldn't say it's validation but you know just to acknowledge that wow you look incredible right so there's a guy out there who's attracted to women you're attracted to dudes and he's just commenting with his eyes or with the way he looks at you or something that, wow, you look really good, right? And that kind of gives you a little bit of a pep in your walk, in your step, and you can carry on with your day. No harm done. So I can't imagine with somebody like an Aisha Curry being married to a Steph Curry, you know, um, NBA players in America are, you know, it seems like are the number one ticket for some of these um, fats out there, right? They absolutely love and adore them. Hence that famous picture of that girl in, the st in a stadium licking, sucking her finger as Steph Curry is walking towards the bench. So there is obviously a side of um, of that culture that is a bit rampant where, you know, there are people, literally women kind of, you know, flying um, over the wall, you know, kind of similar to those whites <laughs> during Game of Thrones, right? They actually hurl themselves over the wall in order to get in touch with, or to, in order to touch a basketball player. So I can imagine in her eyes, maybe she gets some kind of male attention, but I guess in relation to Steph Curry, it's probably pales in comparison. It's probably nowhere near as close as what he gets. So maybe she's kind of using the wrong um mode of comparison because again he's kind of at that kind of apex of sexual attraction when it comes to the uh the um, the industry that he works in but again i think he, she was getting killed online because she supposedly she's kind of been very forthright about the way that she conducts herself in public she's um she doesn't necessarily uh wear a lot of skimpy clothes or show a bum on instagram uh she's quite homely she has her own cooking show um her and steph curry have been together since i think they were 17 or some shit so she always promotes this image of being a a fairly well a, a fairly even killed um down to earth young woman right um so people are saying it's kind of rich coming from her that she's been promoting this image of like this per perfect housewife and that she doesn't understand what why thoughts do what thoughts do and now essentially she's kind of saying she wants the benefits or the riches no sorry the benefits or the fruits of what fox gets right because you know if you're an instagram for, for the most part you have pictures all over your instagram with your bum speak poking out from the back when your cleavage showing you, you're probably used to getting loads of creepy dms from random dudes that you don't know but if you're a girl that is quite modest in the way you dress then it's you know a little bit you got your head screwed on you're probably not getting the same amount of attention and i think in general as human beings we're allowed to have we're allowed to have two of those opinions at the same time. We're allowed to be conservative, modest, and not want to be, you know, sexually vulgar or explicit or let everyone know about what we're getting up to what, or let the world know about everything that's going on in our mind. And we're also allowed to have some privacy, right? You're allowed to have both. You're allowed to be like Cardi B and talk about everything that you, you know, talk openly about everything that's going on in your life on social media. But you're also allowed to sometimes say, you know what? No pictures of my child, please. You know what I mean? Leave us alone. Or we're going through some real relationship stuff. Let us mend it. 
You don't want to do it in the public eye, right? You're allowed to have two of two of those opinions in your head at the same time. And I think sometimes, I don't know why it is with people online or just fans in general, we are so disingenuous to come to the. It's, it's, I'm not sure if it's fake or if it's real or we kind of suspend reality or if we put too much expectation on people that are of a certain celebrity status. But it seems if no one, no one tries to understand or maybe tries to relate with say like, you know what, she's got a point. Because I'm sure there's most, loads of people out there, men and women, who have the same thinking, right? Have the same kind of ilk. I'm sure, I remember hearing actually a comedian say it, um, that their mother or grandmother told them, that they overheard their grandmother speaking to other older ladies and they were kind of reminiscing about the, the age, what age what age did they realise men stop looking at them, right? Because I guess for all other years, especially in the Hollywood industry, most of these women are, you know, fairly attractive, maybe actresses, maybe you know, whatever they may be, right? They work in the entertainment industry, so they look after themselves to a certain degree. They've always been the kind of a center of attention at parties. Men have always kind of wanted to get with them, right? They've you've, they've always had, they've known that they've they, they've known they were they were aware they were attractive since they were a kid, right? They always knew, maybe since they hit puberty, and it was quite fascinating to hear the comedian talk about hearing his grandmother speak about the age that she realized men stopped looking at her. And then it got me thinking too about, wow, man, these are the things as a guy you would never kind of, you know, think about because I don't, I don't know, as a dude, unless you're David Beckham, unless you're a fucking apex attractive dude, you don't necessarily, some dudes don't even know they're attractive. Some dudes don't necessarily, and again, we don't really place too much importance on our attractiveness, our prettiness, our, um, um, our ability to snap necks, right? To get looks. People to gasp. We don't necessarily put much of attention to it because that's when really that happened to a dude. Unless you're again, unless you're Jason Momoa, right? No one's gonna be like, "Oh my god, look how hot he is!" Like it's not really a thing that happens. Um, but with a girl, it's probably something that does happen, right? You walk past a building site, guys are gonna be whistling at you. You walk in a restaurant, certain dudes are gonna be looking at you through the side at right? You you've always kind of got that visceral reaction from people, and I guess they must. It must be such a weird ego trip to suddenly not have that anymore, and it just be radio silence, right? No one's looking at you whatsoever. You're just like. Wow, I'm invisible. And imagine and then imagine imagine that happening when you're sixty or seventy, cool. Natural process of life, your time has come, you know, you had your time, it's now time for a new generation. You're in a whole different way playing anyway. If you're seventy, sixty years old and you're still looking for dudes to look at you, you're probably you know, you probably need to give your head a wobble. But imagine me the age that Aisha Curry is, right? I'm pretty sure she's probably under thirty or something along those kind of lines. And then you're suddenly starting to realise that the dudes don't look at you anymore. That must be a bit weird, right? You must have to a lot of self confidence issues popping in. There's nothing that your husband can really say to kind of help you in that regard, because of course he loves you. That's why he's still there. That's why you've got a lovely family. That's why he goes out and you know shoots fucking three points, you know, game after game after game into game in order to kind of make sure he provides for his family. So he doesn't mind, right? He, he loves you for what you are, but you're like fuck. Is something wrong with me, right? And all, and I guess the automatic thing for somebody like an Aisha Curry, I'm not saying about her in general, but I think for a person that would think that and you're fairly young would be like, I'm going to work, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to start working out. I'm going to start dressing better. I'm going to start taking care of myself. But I guess, you know, Aisha Curry is married to a multimillionaire, man. She's got all the good clothes in the world. She's got the best, access to the best makeup artist ever out there. Hair people, right? Like, and she still feels like she's not getting attention that she needs. Again, I've hoped you has sympathy for people. I think, you know, again, I have sympathy for her. I think in general, it's great that she was honest about it. It's work about a tendency of women to get dressed up partly because they want to look pretty for other people, just to acknowledge, not to touch or anything. I think that's the one deciding line. When women say, I'm only here to dance with my friends, sometimes that is true, right? Guys, leave them alone. But it's it's okay to be like that, man. It's okay to suddenly you think, you know what? I've, I, w- I want to have people side in my DMs too. It's okay to have that feeling. Every girl, every girl should have that feeling, really, to be honest, especially on social media. Especially on fucking social media, with the amount of flipping um, catfishes out there, right? And you're and you're an actually pretty girl who just decides not to always show her cleavage or to suck in your cheeks or to face tune your body, and suddenly no one's kind of sliding into your DMs. Not fair. Not fair. I feel for her. Anyway, moving on. What else do we have here? Asos run Titanic Mills. Tell me something you I'm surprised about. <laughs> Everyone's surprised by us. I don't know why they're surprised, but they are surprised. Uh, wow. Wow. <laughs> wow. Breaking news. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
<laughs> Holy shit. This baby isn't even one years old yet. And it's fucking stirring up mad controversy. Let me hold on. Oh my god. <laughs> they make the screen bigger some presenter from bbc got fired because they referred to the royal baby as a chimpanzee <laughs> people are fucking nuts yo the risk some people take out here man is absolutely crazy that's nuts to say number one and just in this era where you know people are trying to cancel people because of a christmas party right this guy thought he had the balls he had the nerve to refer to a royal baby as a chimpanzee Yo! Um, let's fit the screen here. Whoa! Whoa, whoa, whoa. Okay, this is breaking news, right? So, first of all, I was going to talk about Asshole Satanic Mills, but this can fucking wait, right? Satanic Mills can take a back seat to this one. Um, Mama Mia. Oh, is this Danny Baker? I don't know who Danny Baker is. I don't listen to, do anyone listen to the radio. I don't. Like, I don't know who this Danny Baker guy is, but. Uh, oh my god. Insane. What a mad lad. In 2019, right, where everyone's social justice warrior to the fucking helm, right? People are out there looking to get outraged, right? They're seeking out news, digging through your tweets. You just give them this. You just lay it up to them. Like, here, fuck it. Take my job. Like, wow. Danny Baker fired by BBC of a royal baby chimp tweet. Broadcaster Danny Baker has been fired by BBC of a stupid, unthinking gag on twitter about the duke of duchess new baby just got fired from bbc for the record it was a red source always what is that his, is that his twitter yeah he's not he's not he's, oh, okay is that his real twitter he's not verified doesn't look like it okay anyway in now deleted tweet which has been circulated on social media showed an image of a couple holding hands with a chimpanzee dressed in clothes and a caption royal baby leaves hospital oh my god the five lab presenter was accused of mocking the Dutch's racial heritage. Baker said, just got fired from BBC. A postman said, this is a serious error of judgment. Goes against the values of a situation aimed to abode. Danny's a brilliant broadcaster, but will no longer be representing a weekly show with us. Harry and Meghan, whose mother, uh, Doria Ragland, is African-American, revealed on Wednesday their son was named Archie Harrison uh, Motorbane Windsor. After an initial backlash on social media, Baker said, sorry, my gag pick of the little fella in the posh outfit was whipped. Sum up. Never occurred to me because, well, mind not diseased. Soon as those good enough to point out its possible connotations getting touched, down it came. And that's it. Yo, this guy is a fucking cock, isn't it? I love how, um, I guess you have to do that, right? When you do something of that, when you do when you make an error of that level, I guess you kind of have to be a little bit disingenuous, a little bit snarky, a little bit dismissive about it, right? Like how he's saying at the, at the bottom here, sorry, my gag pick of the little fella in the posh shoot whips him up. You have to kind of be a bit like that because there's, you, it's either two reactions. You kind of dismiss it like, oh, look at these, um, you know, snowflakes overreacting or you double down. There's not, you can't really, you can't really pretend like you didn't know. Oh, that's what he's basically doing, right? You can't really because you know what you're doing. You know the kind of you know you know what you're you know what you're trying to provoke. And the problem is, I don't have an issue with a joke if it's a joke and it's funny. But he's not even a comedian. He doesn't even have the chops to kind of make that funny, like in a really like <gasps> wow, I can't believe he said that way, right? It's just it's just that just comes across as fucked, like super fucked. Mama mia! Again, the baby isn't even one years old. And already this is happening, man. Absolutely nuts. This baby's life is going to be an absolute nuttiness. Like, number one, for the sake that it's a mixed race baby growing up in a family that's predominantly white, right? I'm not sure how they're going to be able to juggle that and um, um, what how they're going to be able to parent that way. Because I know reading, having read a couple of interviews with other people who have kind of, other mixed race people have spoken um, about the, the troubles and how hard it was growing up in a predominantly white neighborhood and then suddenly in, you know, tapping into your black side and the frictions that come with that. And just for me in my area, growing up in Canning Town Custom House, like there were so many, a lot of the racial tensions around my area usually stem from the absent father motive, motif, yeah? So there'll be a lot of, there'll be some, you know, there'll be some, God bless her, really innocent, um, cute girl in the ends who would hook up with some random guy from the ends as well. She end up having a baby. You know, they're too young to have a baby because they're both babies themselves. The boy ends up running away because he doesn't know what else to do. He feels, you know, he feels helpless. He's irresponsible. 
he's reckless he runs away he leaves it all to the girl she's 16 or 15 drops out of school one year before GCSEs hasn't got any qualifications the parents don't really have that much money themselves and all of a sudden now without asking they're suddenly grandparents and they're having to feed another extra mouth in the house right so i can i can understand why there'll be some kind of level of resentment towards that guy and everything he represents whether his area his country his race um whatever it may be i understand why their level of hate will come from and again i'm from that area i'm from customized county town if you're from customized county town you know what those mixed race girls from that area are like right and some of them when they get brought up they get brought up with that kind of resentment towards their father because of course their mothers had to do you know godly ungodly amount of things to kind of keep a roof over their heads and make sure they're fed and don't go hungry so you can only imagine what they must feel like when people tell them they're not black enough right they're like you know what i the last thing that they want to be is associated with black culture because for them black culture reminds them of their you know garbage dump of a dad so they have this weird way they had this weird thing that they grew up in right world where they grew up in a world where their parents and immediate family treat them like they're one of their own, like they're from, you know, like they're essentially Caucasian. But unfortunately, when they go to the outside world, they're immediately classified as a black person, right? No one really treats them as Caucasian at all. It doesn't happen. Um, so there's that constant friction happening, right? Um, and I can only imagine what it must be like for a royal baby. It must be exponentially, right? Up there, right? Really, really crazy. Then you get on the top of it, you get people on this, on the internet or on social media like this, absolute donut danny baker right look at look, look at the face look at the face of this guy right that's the face of the person online 67 years old who's taking a piss out of a baby right that's the kind of that's of what you're having to deal with nowadays not only are the trolls going after celebrities and trying to get them cancelled for saying something wrong or you know talking about somebody's plastic surgery being the wrong and not being not doing that right and blah 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 you got 67 year old washed up radio presenters who no one gives a fuck about trying to get viral off of dissing a baby a fucking baby how nuts is that that the world that we live in? how nuts how nuts imagine 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 you go to journalism school you you know you intern you are assistant you're a, what's that thing called you're a runner you're getting the coffees, you're working on godly amount of hours, maybe you're a producer, maybe you work your way up, and you suddenly, you finally get a, one of those coveted daytime radio TV station slots that people always want, which I never understand because, you know, I guess they pay really well, but you have to wake up at fucking 4 a.m. every day, Monday to Friday. But imagine you've got this amazing job, it pays amazing because the BBC pays fucking ungodly amounts of money to people that aren't very talented. And the BBC essentially is a job for life, right? And then you fuck it up because you wanted to get off a funny tweet about the baby looking like a chimpanzee. All right, mate. Absolute nutcase. Absolute nutcase. And again, like I said, the baby's not even one. I was taking a piss out of Megan with her baby bump. She was getting on my nerves everywhere. She was going fucking caressing her baby bump. But that has more to do with the general climate of fucking, you know, gender reveal stuff. Antoine Griezmann did one recently, kicking a ball and it's like, fuck off. It's just, it just annoys me. I hate everything about it, right? But, mamma mia, man. Like, pray for that lady, man. They, 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 they're going to be in for a flurry of fucking nonsense online and on in TV and in general from people. Q, you know, Q, Q 10 second countdown to this donut appearing on Good Morning Britain on one of those shows and trying to explain himself out, out of this fucking bag. Like, absolute idiot. What an absolute idiot. But anyway, you know, again, I guess this is the thing, man. Internet, internet, the internet viral virus really has no it doesn't respect it has no real age limit does it a lot of people say oh it's the kids man millennials there's some young rappers are going into fucking dunkin donuts jumping over the counter stealing a whole rack of donuts to get viral to get media attention and then to kind of parlay that into music that's what the kids are doing that's what they say right the kids the kids the kids but you've got a 67 year old man here right 67 right i don't know what how old he is. doesn't matter let's say he's 80, 97 he's, he's he's white and he smokes cigarettes and drinks wine you have no idea but you've got a 67 year old man here trying to get viral and say something funny right and that's and, that, and that's what you get and then he tries to back it up by saying just got fired from bbc ha 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 yeah mate you have and no one's gonna touch you with a barge pole now because you're a fucking racist <laughs> it's like is that really worth it honestly these guys are psychos man and we don't even have like do we have it'd be different if we had like um a turning point usa if we had a if we had quite a few or like um what's that one that um um ben shapiro talks on we don't really have many real conservative media platforms do we 
like all that that are big for the most part do we have any because it make more sense if that happened like that if there was a a really well known media a Tory kind of run radio station or whatever media platform so that when you do these things in the kind of you know social left and you kind of get cancelled you can sort of go somewhere else and present your show right okay i did you know freedom of speech and all that sort of stuff you start rabbiting on about that and you can start rambling on for hours and hours on stream on those platforms we don't really have them we don't really have them in the uk so essentially he's like in no man's land here right right like even celebrities don't want to be known even there's there's a lot of celebrities out there that who are Tory who won't say it publicly because they know it'll do their career. You can't necessarily do you could probably do that in the US. No, you probably couldn't actually. And I'm sure there's a lot of so probably a lot of alien celebrities out there who don't say they're conservative, who are secretly conservative, actually. Yeah. Um again, wild thing to do, but again, I think the internet viral virus uh, really has no age, uh, no socioeconomic um it doesn't it doesn't care about your colour or your creed. If you care about being viral, you will do just about anything. You'll probably sell yourself short. You will fuck up your entire career just so you can see that notification ticker going to overdrive. <sighs> Sad state of affairs um, for all involved. Like I said, have Meghan Markle and Prince Harry in your prayers because that baby's in for an absolute shit show of a life in it. From not in terms of the family, but in terms of just you know social media, the thing that people are gonna say is just gonna be insane. Like ugh. Just, yeah, it's just annoying for the most part. Imagine when the baby has to... Imagine when they braid the baby's hair. <laughs> you can just see the Daily Mail articles now, man. Oh, what a shit show. Anyway, let's leave that there. Mm, what else? <sighs> Jesus Christ. <laughs> imagine saying that about a fucking baby. What is wrong with you? <laughs> the guys are not gays, man. Oh my god, some of these dudes are so comfortable in their job. You yeah, honestly now, especially now, didn't that Asian lady get fired recently from Emmerdale or something because of some tweets that she sent out talking to her friend, right? Talking to her friends who she spoke to like that with her friends. Again, I don't agree with it, but you know, her friends are comfortable with her saying it to them. So who are we as a society to judge about it? And you think you can say that? Dude. Anyway, I think that might be it, man. That might be where we end it there. See, we take home and taking a gob of water. Um, yeah, this episode number one nine one, the Excellent Zinger Show. Thank you so much for tuning in. My website is excellentzinger.com. You can find that below in the description. Um, if you're watching via YouTube, like, subscribe, all that bullshit. Watching via, listening via the podcast app, download, oh, no, no, download, download, you obviously downloaded it. Leave me a five-star review. That'll go a long way into making sure people find out about the show. I'll be seeing you guys again tomorrow. Tomorrow's Friday. I'm DJing at Tappies from a night called Tapped. You can find details of that in my on my website under DJ Gigs. All the listeners of nights are on there. And I'll see you guys again tomorrow for another episode of the show. Peace.